Hitler's inner circle begins in the final days of World War I. At an airfield in eastern France, the most famous German squadron of all time, Richthofen's Flying Circus, await their next mission. Seven months ago, they lost their legendary leader, Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. But a new hero has stepped in to fill the void. A fighter pilot ace named Hermann Goering. But Goering faces a crisis. Rumors are rife that the German Emperor is about to throw in the towel. But Goering is defiant. The war may be going badly, and his squadron down to half, but he's not for surrender. Goering galvanizes his men to prepare for a last death or glory battle. But almost as soon as the cheers die down, orders arrive halting all air operations on the Western Front. The Kaiser has abandoned them and fled to Holland. Germany is on the verge of surrender. For Goering, like many proud Germans, the news is a shattering blow. To Goering, this war was lost not by brave Germans on the battlefield, but thrown away by the cowardly backroom maneuverings of left-wing politicians. Goering's orders are to hand his aircraft to the Allies, but he has no intention of obeying those who betrayed him. To stop them falling into enemy hands, Goering instructs his men to fly home and crash land their aircraft on German soil. Germany may have surrendered, but Goering will not. The Germany Goering will return to is a nation in crisis. Poverty and starvation are everywhere. Law and order has broken down, and a socialist revolution is sweeping the country. The German intelligentsia are deeply divided between extreme left and far right-wing politics. And in southern Germany, the Bavarian capital of Munich is a hotbed of these extremist views. Among the city's outspoken right-wing elite is a 50-year-old Bavarian poet and dramatist called Dietrich Eckhart. Eckhart is well known to be a heavy drinker, but having made his name and fortune as a playwright before the war, he's also wealthy and well-connected. But those views are of the extreme far right, and in keeping with the times, his paper, Auf gut Deutsch, or in good German, is a rabidly racist Jew-baiting sheet. Eckhart also has connections with a secretive right-wing occultist group known as the Tula Society. As bizarre as their beliefs seem, in the shattered German psyche, the notion of a once glorious past offers a compelling escape from the reality of humiliation. But there's a dark side to the Tula Society myth. They believe the superhuman Aryans had been weakened by interbreeding with inferior and morally corrupt races. Now these inferior races are in control, and the chaos Eckhart sees in Germany is the result. Eckhart fervently believes that the enemies of Aryan Germany are the Bolsheviks, the Communists, and most of all, the Jews. Eckhart wants to hit back at these enemies within. But to succeed, he must get his message beyond the elite and out to the masses. He needs to reach the disaffected working classes. <sighs> Meanwhile, with his squadron disbanded, Hermann Goering returns to Munich. And Goering tastes the humiliation directly. Street violence is rife, and former military officers like Goering are at the top of the socialist gang's hit list. He is attacked by thugs, who try to rip the military insignia from his uniform. It is not the physical beating, but the flagrant disrespect for the uniform that will mark him forever. 
Unable to find work in Munich, the fighter pilot ace is reduced to scratching a living as a traveling stunt pilot. In early 1919, he escapes the mayhem and flies out of Germany. It's this compulsion to flee chaos that will become a feature of his future career. But others, like Dietrich Eckhart, are determined to make a stand. In early 1919, Eckhart and Tula Society occultists launch their plan to spread their right-wing message. They form a fledgling political group, the German Workers' Party. It's just one of many small factions that spring up and meet in the beer halls and cellars of Munich. But Germany's humiliation is far from over. And soon a further downturn in Germany's fortunes will ensure Eckhart's lunatic Aryan ideas find fresh ears. In the summer of 1919, the victorious allies gather in Paris. And on the 28th of June, they and Germany sign a momentous document, the Versailles Treaty. There is widespread rejoicing across Europe. But for Germany, the treaty is disastrous. It demands compensation and revenge for World War I. Germany is fined more than 260 billion gold marks, the equivalent of $860 billion in today's money. A fifth of their industry is taken over by the Allies, and they are stripped of all overseas colonies. While in Europe, they're forced to give up a massive 13% of German territory and hand it to neighboring countries. Almost 7 million Germans lose their citizenship and are forced to become part of nations like Poland and Czechoslovakia. Eckhart's once proud Germany, the rising industrial powerhouse of Europe, has been crippled. In August 1919, a new democratic government, the Weimar Republic, takes shape, designed to replace the autocratic rule of the Kaiser and his generals. But to Eckhart, it's weak, and dominated by Jewish and liberal politicians. He's determined his party should take them on. But to do that, he needs a man who can speak directly to the people, an inspirational leader. In the autumn of 1919, at a German workers' party meeting, a spy lurks in the crowd. He's been sent by the German army to report on proceedings. But the young man finds the anti-communist and anti-Semitic opinions chiming strongly with his own. Inspired, he stops taking notes and starts addressing the crowd. His name is Adolf Hitler. Eckhart is transfixed. Eckhart sees the man to take his message to the people, to spread the Aryan ideals beyond the metropolitan elite, perhaps even inspire a nation. Eckhart isn't the only person captivated by Hitler. In the crowd is a young university student, Rudolf Hess. From a wealthy family, Hess had been a brave and disciplined soldier during the war. He too had found refuge in the mythical politics of the Tula Society. And the moment he hears Hitler speak, he falls under his spell. The besotted Hess will become one of Hitler's first disciples and a founding member of the Inner Circle he will soon be joined by others. Among them is a troublesome 19-year-old schoolteacher's son. His name is Heinrich Himmler. Himmler had turned 18 in the final days of World War I and had been desperate to prove himself as a soldier, but it was too late. Himmler an avid diary writer and stamp collector, had been a sickly child. Himmler's father had been keen to keep him out of trouble and had enrolled him to study agriculture at Munich University. But Himmler's head is full of the same myths and monsters as the occultists Eckhart and Hess, and his take on farming is very different to his fellow students. And soon, this wannabe soldier will meet the man to bring his dreams to fruition and give Himmler the chance to fight 
for his crazy ideals. For now, though, that man is far from the finished article. Although Eckhart believes Hitler is the prophesied redeemer, he recognizes that this young firebrand is a rough stone that needs careful polishing. But Eckhart frequently finds the rough stone difficult to polish. But gradually, Eckhart refines Hitler's etiquette, and these two men, though more than 20 years apart in age, become close. With Hitler now installed as the party's head of propaganda, the two men get to work refining the theories and beliefs of the movement. Together, they are a formidable team. The Nazis pledge to take back the lands stolen by the Treaty of Versailles and put an end to the crippling payments demanded by the Allies. Eckhart gives them their rallying cry. Deutschland erwache, Germany awake. And the party also gets a new emblem, believed by Tula Society mystics to be of ancient Aryan origin the swastika. And the movement is rebranded as the National Socialist Workers' Party. The Nazi Party is born. The movement is slowly gaining momentum, and powerful men are beginning to take notice. Men like Captain Ernst Röhm. For the Nazis, Röhm, still a serving officer in the German army, could be a key asset. He has access to both men and weapons. But under the Versailles Treaty, Rome's beloved army has shrunk to just 100,000 men, and the Allies are seizing and destroying their equipment. So the army pick Rome to secretly establish unofficial paramilitary groups and stockpile weapons. And Rome uses fear and violence to get the job done. Röhm is inevitably drawn to the Nazi message and to their charismatic new spokesman. But his relationship with Hitler is no love affair. To him, Hitler is a means to his own ends. So Röhm joins the movement, supporting Hitler financially and introducing him to senior patriotic military officers. The party is growing, but if they are to make a real difference, they must do more than rabble rows in beer cellars. In December 1920, Eckhart and Röhm see a chance to get the Nazi message out onto the streets. They raise funds to buy the Tula Society's failing weekly newspaper. It's an early foray into mass propaganda, a tool the Nazis will learn to use with breathtaking efficiency. At this point, Hitler is still officially just the party's mouthpiece, but Eckhart, installed as the paper's editor-in-chief, wastes no time in selling his vision of Hitler as Germany's messiah. But Eckhart refers to Hitler as der Kommenden Grossen, the coming great one. Ascribing to him the mystical powers of an Aryan mythical Teutonic chieftain, it captures the imagination of his readers, but also feeds Hitler's ego. And Eckhart isn't the only Nazi to see Hitler in this way. The now devoted Rudolf Hess throws himself into doing Hitler's bidding. Shortly after Eckhart's article, Hess begins addressing Hitler as the leader, der Führer. Hess's Führer is about to be transformed. In July 1921, the Nazi party is thrown into crisis. Eckhart discovers that the party's official leader, Anton Drexler, is attempting to merge with other political groups. Hitler is furious. Why should their manifesto be polluted by other parties? He immediately resigns. But secretly, Hitler has no intention of turning his back on the Nazis. Eckhart takes Hitler's ultimatum to the party and calls a vote. With an overwhelming majority, 543 to 1, they ditch Drexler and make Hitler their official leader. Eckhart has handed Hitler complete control of the Nazi party, but he will soon live to regret it. The Nazis are still only a small fringe organization, 
If they are to fulfill their plan to seize power by force, they need more than words. They need an army. Ernst Röhm starts creating the party's own paramilitary force, the so-called sports section. By the autumn of 1921, it has 300 men and a new name, the Storm Section, or Sturmabteilung. Rome's SA ejects hecklers from meetings and intimidates political opponents. But they're ill-disciplined. They need a leader. And as an army officer, Rome can't be seen to do it. As if on cue, the perfect man for the job returns to Munich. Renowned war hero Hermann Göring is back. And the ambitious former fighter ace heads straight for the cause that could hand him the power and influence he craves. Göring doesn't buy into all Hitler's extremist policies, but he's willing to set aside any moral objections for his own personal power and recognition. A day after first seeing Hitler talk, the two men meet, and Göring fully understands his worth to Hitler and the Nazi party. Along with the other members of the growing inner circle, they will begin to bring the fledgling Nazi party out of the shadows. With Hess recruiting ever more members and Röhm securing secret army training, Göring sets about turning the Sturm Abteilung into a formidable force. Hitler would later state, I gave him a disheveled rabble. In a very short time, he had organized a division of 11,000 men. But as the stars of Göring, Röhm and Hess are on the rise, Dietrich Eckhardt finds himself increasingly pushed out of Hitler's circle. Hitler has grown weary of his mentor, and Eckhardt turns more and more to the bottle. Eckhardt is labeled by Hitler as a fatalist, a pedant, and a pessimist. Ernst Röhm also faces a crisis. He has started drawing the attention of his army commanders, Worried by his increasing involvement in extreme right-wing politics, he's given an ultimatum to choose between his career or the Nazi party. For now, Rome continues to recruit willing fighters to his militia, and one particularly enthusiastic young idealist catches his eye, the wannabe soldier Heinrich Himmler. Rome introduces Himmler to the growing Nazi party, and in August 1923, he becomes party member 14,303. At first, he remains under Röhm's wing. There are few indications that he will become the most murderous and feared anti-Semite of them all. The key players are now in place. All they need is an opportunity to make their mark. Events conspire to help them when Germany plunges into economic chaos as hyperinflation grips the economy. A loaf of bread rises from 165 marks to over 1 billion in just 10 months. The Weimar government has no choice but to default on Germany's repayments to the Allies. In retaliation, French and Belgian troops seize one of Germany's few assets, the Ruhr, the country's industrial heartland. For the first time, Foreign troops are on German sovereign territory. For Goering and the Nazis, this is a call to arms. Goering knows the clock is ticking, and he wants to act now. The economic crisis is hitting party coffers hard, and his SA militia are becoming restless. For Rome, it's decision time. He chooses to resign from the army and gamble everything on a successful Nazi coup. Röhm then eggs Hitler on, insisting that much of the army supports them and won't stand in their way. It's agreed. Now is the time to seize power. But how? The inspiration comes from abroad. Europe's most successful fascist, Benito Mussolini, had stormed to power in Italy just months earlier. He'd acquired huge popular support and marched on Rome 
with his 30,000 strong militia. The plan is to take Bavaria first, before marching on the national government in Berlin. Bavaria rests in the hands of three people, the head of the police, the military, and the state prime minister, Gustav von Kahr. If they can get these three men on side, they'd have the army and the police behind them. But there's a problem. Unlike Mussolini, Hitler is still largely unknown outside Munich. To stand any chance of success, they need a temporary figurehead with nationwide appeal. They approach General Erich Ludendorff, hero of the German right and one of the great commanders of World War I. When the Nazis hear that Prime Minister von Kahr is holding a public meeting in the Bürgerbräukeller, one of Munich's main beer halls, and that the chiefs of the Bavarian army and police will also be there, they know they have to move fast. Göring immediately mobilizes his SA stormtroopers. He and Hess will lead an assault on the Bürgerbräukeller itself. Their plan? to hijack the meeting and capture the three key players in one fell swoop. Once they're secured, SA units, including Rome's and Himmler's, will take control of the key military and police buildings around the city. They await the call to go. For Göring, it's the moment he's been waiting for. Göring arrives at the Bürgerbräukeller with a hundred of his heavily armed elite SA shock troops. In all, 600 essays surround the hall. Inside, Gustav von Kahr is addressing the crowd, and as predicted, the chiefs of the Bavarian police and army are with him. Hitler declares, the National Socialist Revolution has broken out. Hitler tries to convince the three state leaders to join the coup, but they refuse. Hitler desperately needs the persuasive power of their national figurehead, Ludendorff, but he hasn't arrived. Pistol in hand, Hitler threatens them, but they won't budge. Back in the main hall, Hess targets senior political opponents for kidnap to remove them from the city, while Goering keeps the crowd in check. With the beer hall locked down, Röhm gets the call to action. He orders his men to march on the Bavarian War Ministry. Himmler proudly carries the old imperial banner. All over the city, SA units close in on their targets. But back at the beer hall, Göring struggles to maintain calm, and Hitler's negotiations are in stalemate. In a desperate attempt to turn things round, he makes an impassioned speech to the crowd, lying that the government have agreed to back them. Amazingly, the crowd believes him, and then, as if perfectly choreographed, Ludendorff arrives. Ludendorff works his magic, and the leaders of Bavaria agree to join them. The Nazi coup is suddenly ignited. Out on the streets, Röhm and Himmler's unit have seized control of the war ministry. And some army and police units around Munich even agree to join the uprising. It begins to look like the coup is going to succeed. Hitler then decides to leave Göring and Ludendorff in charge to check on Rome's progress. Von Kahr assures Ludendorff he won't betray them. He walks past Göring's drunken troops and leaves. In another beer hall across town, Dietrich Eckhardt, Hitler's one-time mentor, is completely oblivious to the putsch taking place. When the caller informs Eckhardt that von Kahr has been released, he sees the danger. Eckhardt's instincts are right. Von Kahr quickly rallies the army. In an instant, the tables are turned on the Nazis. The coup has stalled. And as the sun rises the next day, Göring and the rest of the inner circle are unsure what to do. That morning, 
Eckhart heads to Nazi Party HQ. The SA troops are chanting his slogan, Germany awake. But Eckhart, the man who helped ignite it all, has been totally left out of the coup. Then, his former protege arrives. In an attempt to keep the coup alive, Ludendorff now takes the initiative. The Nazis set off for the center of Munich in a last desperate roll of the dice. And they link arms. But the authorities are waiting for them. Goering is shot in the leg and is badly wounded in the mayhem. 16 Nazis are killed and many more injured. And Hitler only just cheats death. Eckhart watches as the man he'd molded as the Great One flees to save his life. The coup has ended in complete disaster. Badly injured, Goering escapes to Austria. Exiled from his country, a wanted man, his dreams of glory shattered. Rudolf Hess also flees to Austria, while Himmler returns to his mother's house, not yet a big enough player to attract the attention of the authorities. Röhm turns himself in and is jailed along with Hitler. The putsch was a total failure. The inner circle is broken, their party disbanded, and the Führer behind bars. But together, they have learned a valuable lesson. In the years to come, the failed putsch will be rewritten into Nazi folklore as a triumphant struggle. But Dietrich Eckhart won't live to see the rise of the Third Reich. Just six weeks after the failed coup, he lies dying. Years of alcohol abuse have taken their toll. His final words are prophetic. Follow Hitler. He will dance, but it is I who called the tune. Do not mourn for me. I shall have influenced history more than any German. Hitler's circle of evil isn't finished yet. <laughs>